uh, thanks for uh, staying up later, getting up earlier, uh, making the time to learn about CouchDB. Um, before we get started on CouchDB, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm one of the co-authors of this lovely book, and uh, I have been a CouchDB committer since late 2008. I work mostly on the, um, the JavaScript side of CouchDB, although uh, that's not to say I don't work on the Erlang side, but I just really enjoy uh, writing JavaScript on the server side. Uh, and I'm a co-founder of Couch.io, which is doing all kinds of, you know, uh, commercial support and uh, hosting and whatnot for CouchDB. So let's get started. Um, the first thing you need to know about uh, about CouchDB is our motto is relax, and that means a lot of things um, in in the Couch world. Uh, the big one is you can relax; your data is safe with us. So CouchDB has a very robust storage model that I'll get into later. Um, but we also strive for simplicity. Uh, simplicity is a good way to be robust. But um, it, we want to be the Honda Accord of databases, not a Ferrari of databases. So. Um, you know, we get some nice side effects out of being really simple, such as being scalable, but uh, we're, not, we're not trying to build a dragster. We're trying to build something that people can use every day without having to worry about. Um, so this talk is going to be mostly an intro for people who are new to CouchDB. I know there's people in the chat room that know, uh, you know, as much about CouchDB as I do. Um, so hopefully it's still fun for you all. Um, and there will be another talk in this series next month that's going to be a lot more technical with code and whatnot, but if that's what you're in the mood for. Uh, keep an eye on the schedule in my Twitter stream. Hear about it. So, uh, CouchDB aspires to a really interesting goal uh, compared to most of the databases you're probably familiar with, and that is ground computing. Uh, the idea is that as a user, you have um, you have the data at the edge on your local host, and that solves a whole lot of problems, um, both technical problems and sort of, you know, social, political problems around uh, around data control issues, but we, we'll get into that later. Um, it, it also is just sort of the right way to build something if you want to build uh, even scalable centralized clusters. So ground computing as opposed to cloud computing really just gives a lot more control. Um, so CouchDB is designed for offline mode, uh, much like its inspiration Lotus Notes. The idea is that you have a full copy of the data set on your local host. You can work with it even when your network is unavailable. Um, or, you know, if you have, uh, if you're sharing a local server with some other people in your work group and that server is disconnected from the internet, when your internet connection comes back, the changes will sync back up with a cloud, uh, you know, if you've designated a cloud copy of that database, kept in sync as well. Um, and so this has a really nice uh, property that I'll talk about more later. Um, so back in uh, back in about 2005 or so, I think it was. There's the data portability movement, and most of their goals were really met uh, when more web services started to offer uh, RSS and Atom feeds and APIs and whatnot. But uh, the one goal that was really never met is this idea of data portability by default. The idea that uh, if your web services all share a common API then there's no extra work that the developers have to do to provide an API, and all the APIs are interoperable. That's the, um, that's the dream that CouchDB could achieve for us in the future, um, you know, after it becomes ubiquitous. Uh, so we'll uh, talk more about that later, too, but that's just to set the stage. Um, the thing that drew me to CouchDB, and I think it was this very blog post, it had been on my radar, um, and then I read this blog post from Jacob Kaplan Moss, uh, which I'll read the quote. Uh, let me tell you something. Django may be built for the web, but CouchDB is built of the web. I've never seen software that so completely embraces the philosophies behind HTTP. This is what the software of the future looks like. And so, you know, when I read that and looked at the technical details of how CouchDB works, it all kind of clicked in my head and I couldn't think about anything else and I've been working on CouchDB ever since. It's a, it's a pretty good take on what we do. Um, not, it doesn't tell the full story of what Couch is good for, but it's sort of the point on the horizon uh, that we're at. So part of being uh, built of the web, this is just an example, CouchDB ships with a test suite that runs in the browser. Um, and this is, uh, it's cool because it's written in JavaScript, so it makes it easy for new people to contribute more test cases. And uh, say if you have a feature request, if you contribute that feature request with a test case, it's a lot easier to get somebody to uh, to write the Erlang side of it for you. 
So uh, you run this test suite and it runs in the browser. It's going to go through whatever proxies you have between you and your couch. It is um, an extra bonus because it really tests the full stack. Um, hopefully the audio is... Uh, hey Chris, um, it's Catherine yeah. here. Can you hear me? It is getting a little choppy and I'll tell you what will improve it. On the camera uh, window, you have a button. If you hover over it, it'll say pause my camera. So just smile at the camera and pause it. And that'll leave a little more bandwidth for the audio. Yeah, all right, that's probably a good idea. Um, just except for I don't see the pause button. Maybe I have a slightly different. It should oh, be a little something square. There. OK. Yeah, I do see it. OK, uh, you it paused. Work? Yeah, it worked. Oh, now it's it's on again. Wait. I'm going to be patient because I keep getting that little rainbow beach ball, and I don't want to mess with it when I have that. Oh, I hate that thing. OK. All right. Um, but I think here it comes. Uh, okay. After this last little rainbow happens, I think I'll be able to click. OK, that's paused. Good. Go ahead. All right. OK, good. So these are some of the users of CouchDB. Um, and uh, <laughs> and I'll, I'll go through them one by one because they're all uh, they're all really interesting and use CouchDB uh, uniquely in their own way. So uh, the the BBC uses Couch for a large scale key value store. Um, you can you can find links to Enda Farrell's blog post about this, or I'll paste them in the chat later. Um, and uh, so they have a multi data center with automatic failover. Uh, system and it's all designed um, because the BBC has a public obligation to be reliable. Um, you know, a big news day in the UK is not necessarily an easy day to get to work, and it's probably going to drive a lot of traffic to BBC. So they need to have a system that uh, you know won't uh, won't give them any surprises when uh, you know something big happens and they and they can't get down to the data center to add a new server or something. Um, so we're really we're really proud about that BBC deployment because um, you know it shows that that someone who did a lot of research about what's going to be reliable uh, chose CouchDB. Uh, so Mozilla is also a, a really great user of Couch. Um, they uh, they use it in a in a slightly different way. When you do your uh, Firefox uh, you know crash reports or when they run their internal tests on new builds of Firefox. All those are saved as JSON documents in Couch. So since the uh, data structure uh, can be loose and all the documents can be a little bit different in a Couch database, um, they then can go after the fact and write queries that pull out, um, you know, oh, this version of Firefox on this URL uh, is crashing in this way, um, and prioritize what bugs need to be worked on. So it's uh, it's a pretty good. Um, Pretty good use of CouchDB because they, they really leverage the fact that things can be flexible and that you can define your queries after the fact rather than have to, having to worry about the structure of your data up front. Um, they also have a project, the um, Mozilla Messaging has a project called Raindrop, which is their next generation messenger, uh, which uses the offline mode. So there's a, um, you know, there's a server portion that handles your IMAP connections and whatnot. But as a um, user, you just run CouchDB on your local host. And replicate with the server, so you get uh, you get a nice web app that's running locally. So if your network goes down, you still have the app running. Um, so there's a lot of things we'll talk about where CouchDB bridges the desktop and the web. Um, IBM was a big supporter of CouchDB and uh, employed Damien Katz for a long time, and uh, they use it for some other internal projects as well. Mebo uses CouchDB. Uh, they wrote a clustering framework called CouchDB Lounge that we'll talk about later. So. They are doing a lot of their new development. They, they first started out using Couch as a um, you know, sort of a pilot project to take polls in their advertising system. Um, and they've since moved on to doing a whole lot of their new development in there. Uh, Couch.io is my company doing commercial support and hosting for CouchDB. Um, and then Assay Depot is another really cool one. They uh, use CouchDB to facilitate data sharing in the pharmaceutical industry. So if you have two, you know, big competitors, but they still want to uh, share some lab resources. It's you know sort of open sourcing laboratory work in the pharmaceutical industry. And so Couch allows them to share some data, but not all data, and make sure that um, these companies are comfortable using their service as a sort of a data gateway. 
um, Cloud Split does uh, Amazon pricing, so they'll tell you how uh, you know how you're doing on your your EC2 bill uh, in an up to the minute kind of way. And Cloudant is another CouchDB based startup. They do hosting, so um, if you want large scale CouchDB hosting, that's what Cloudant's really going after. And they do some real time stuff with uh, you know some some Twitter search companies and whatnot. Um, but the biggest use case that that I'm really happy to see is Canonical's Ubuntu One, uh, which really uses Couch in the way that it was designed for. They have a cloud, um, or, or they have a server that they that they run that has you know a few hundred thousand uh, users on it, and each of those users core has their local CouchDB on their desktop. So CouchDB ships as part of Ubuntu One, or as as part of the Ubuntu operating system, and applications store their data in it. So Gwibber stores tweets and Facebook messages in it. Um, you know, Tomboy Notes stores the notes in it. Uh, you can store your Firefox bookmarks in CouchDB, and then uh, it automatically synchronizes between all your desktops and laptops. Uh, they even sync contacts with different phones from the iPhone all the way down um, to the old cheap phone. And, uh, and it's all backed up in the cloud in practically real time. So if you throw your laptop in a lake, you've still got your data to get a new laptop and sync it with your Ubuntu One account. Um, so this is really the use case that, uh, that, that Damian Katz was excited about when he started on Couch and to see them deploying it in such a big scale is uh, it's really fulfilling. So that's enough of background who's using Couch. Um, oh, maybe it's not. So there's also, <laughs> um, I don't have my, uh, my cheat and look at the next slide feature here like I do on Keynote. So uh, these are a bunch of apps that are uh, written in Ajax, HTML5, and served directly out of the Couch. Uh, it's a messy collection of screenshots here because I wanted to get across uh, how many there really are, and this isn't even close to all of them. Um, but you know, there's blogging apps and calendars and a to-do manager, Twitter clients, um, a delicious clone, more than one presentation software, some e-commerce sites. Um, there's a, that, that one at the top is a gallery for processing JS stuff. So this is the direction that I'm really excited about with CouchDB, and this is where I spend my, my research energy. Um, so my next, uh, my next O'Reilly webcast is going to be about these Couch apps that are served directly out of the Couch. Um, and so these have uh, some interesting properties that they replicate around uh, all the data, you know, moves with the application. Uh, and it makes it so that you've got your application source code when you're browsing the data, um, kind of taking the view source that originally, you know, fueled so much of the web growth with people learning HTML and uh, and moving it into the server side JavaScript, um, you know, dynamic database applications. So the Couch App stuff, I will I'll do another one of these talks in about a month where we dig into code really deep. Um, so for people who are interested in that, uh, it should be exciting. Um, so here's a little bit about our adoption, um, kind of an old Google Trends graph, but SimpleDB was about the closest thing to Couch out when uh, you know we first started doing CouchDB, and uh, you can see that I think people prefer the idea of running their own database, not not living, letting it live in the cloud. Um, there's books from all the major publishers, and there's like an uncountable number of uh, you know projects on GitHub and Google Code and whatnot uh, that use CouchDB. So uh, now let's get into the technical features of CouchDB. This is probably what you really came here for um, now that I've shown you people using it in exciting ways. Um, so we'll go down this list in order. I'll talk about the storage engine. I'll uh, give you an overview of JSON because I think especially for people who are coming from a relational background, uh, understanding the flexibility of JSON documents is really important. Uh, we'll talk about the power of replication. And I'll show some MapReduce functions so you can see how it's not wizardry. It's a, just a really simple way to query your data. Um, and then I'll talk about the benefits of being based in uh, the web. So the storage engine. Uh, CouchDB's storage engine is uh, it's, it's pretty unique in that it's pure tail append storage. So a lot of databases do uh, you know, append only B trees, but they use a write ahead log or um, you know, various other uh, essentially optimizations on the storage layer to um, optimize for old hardware that we don't have to deal with anymore. So uh, Couch, CouchDB's storage engine only ever writes to the end of the file. That means that no matter what happens, once your data is written, it's safe. So Couch is never going to go in there and edit bytes that are already on disk. 
Um, if there's a power failure or a hard crash of any kind, uh, there's no, um, no fix-up phase when you reboot and anything that was committed to disk is there just as it was. So unlike, uh, you know, a my ISAM rebuild or something where you're going to sit around and, and hope for the best of your fingers crossed all weekend while your big, you know, table uh, checks itself, CouchDB is always consistent uh, and always ready to go. There's some other, you know, nice effects we get from having a pure tail of pin storage. And so concurrent writes and reads are um, supported, you know, all the way at the low level. So it's, it's not just the Erlang implementation, but the entire design of CouchDB is designed around having uh, you know, thousands of concurrent clients. Um, you can do, it's, this also, it gives you some operational advantages. So if any of you out there are, you know, ops people or, or DBAs, uh, you can back up a couch DB just using, uh, just using the copy command or rsync or anything. If you just start copying, you know, that file over to another machine, it'll be a consistent snapshot of the database when it gets there. So a couch DB database is one file and you copy it over and you've got a backup. Um, so this means that you do have to run compaction. All this append only nature means that uh, periodically you have to compact the file to reclaim wasted space, but that's a fair, a fair price to pay for all these benefits. Um, so here's a graph of what you get from, from this sort of storage engine. The blue stuff is memcached DB. So that's memcached backed by Berkeley DB. And uh, over there on the far left-hand side, you see that it's way faster than CouchDB for um, for writes, and uh, and that's that's when you're in the uh, in the working memory set. But as soon as your database gets larger than what your computer can keep in memory, the memcached DB starts swapping and trying to do all these uh, you know strategies to get uh, the data in and out of the disk, um, and CouchDB just keeps trucking along uh, smoothly. And that's because we don't do any, um, you know, any caching in our application memory. We let the file system cache handle it all for us. So we get this really nice, smooth uh, order login, drop off on performance. This BBC test ran over two days and they were uh, writing with four writers and reading with 16 readers. Uh, CouchDB's performance was reliable and, um, you know, as close to linear as you could hope for. So they were really impressed. This is, I think, what sealed the deal for them. Um, so that's enough on the storage engine. Now let's talk about uh, let's talk about JSON documents. I have a feeling that most people are uh, familiar with JSON, but I don't want to uh, assume anything. So here is an example JSON document. Um, JSON is a serialization of the JavaScript native data types, so strings, uh, booleans, numbers. Um, and uh, arrays and, and hash maps or objects or um, you know, whatever you want to call them. Uh, so each document is a JSON object and it has as many uh, sub key value pairs as you'd like. There's only two required key value pairs and that is uh, the ID and the rev. So the, uh, the ID is unique in a database. It, uh, it's how you use, it's, it's how you look up a document using the HTTP API. So you just do a get against the URL corresponding to that ID and you get back the document. And when you want to change it, you do a put. The rev is an opaque token that your application uses uh, <laughs> to, to give uh, currency control so that whoever saves first wins. No one's going to save over your work accidentally. So you, when you go to save a document, if someone else was saved in the intervening time, then you've got to, uh, reload their version of the document and remerge your changes into that before you can save it again. So this is the basis of our concurrency control. Uh, so one property about JSON is that uh, you can have this Boolean attribute here. Dark Vader, uh, dark side is true, but you know, maybe, uh, maybe on, a, on a really good day, uh, the dark side switches to more cowbell. Um, and so there's nothing in CouchDB that's going to prevent you from having completely dynamic schemas. So if your application decides that all of a sudden it's time to start writing, uh, you know, that field as a string instead of a Boolean or to add a new field to some records, you don't have to do any migrations or touch any of your old documents. Um, of course, you know, it's, no, it's not a magic bullet. Your application also needs to uh, under, understand the potential variations in your documents. But uh, I think that, you know, having the flexibility on the front end to save stuff and then just being able to clean it up when you read it is 
Uh, so it's a much better fit for the way data looks in uh, you know these these days of the web. So uh, JSON documents, those are great, um, but replication is even better. Um, so replication uh, is, you know, JSON is, is flexibility for your data structures. Replication is flexibility for your deployments and your, your clustering or your ad hoc work groups. So you've got a couch, and then you've got two couches, and you want to make them the same. So you just do uh, a post, an HTTP post with a JSON body to one of these couches, and you say, you know, replicate from this source to, the, to, to my local target here. Replication could go either way, uh, from the target to the source or vice versa. But in this case, we're, um, we're doing a pool replication. So, uh, so now what we're going to do is move every, every piece of data on the first database to the second database. And if we were to trigger it again, only any changes that had happened in the intervening period would be replicated. So it's incremental. Um, and that makes it efficient. And it's also flexible. So you could do something like a tra traditional master-slave architecture where you've got uh, all the writes directed to the couch on the left and all the reads directed to the couch on the right. Um, so this is simple to do with a reverse proxy. You could just uh, proxy all the gets to the slave couches and everything else to the master couch. And that's pretty much going to do the trick for you. Um, as long as you have continuous replication set up between them, then you have got uh, load balancing for reads. Um, but the replication can be bidirectional as well. Uh, there's no, there's really no limits to it. You can have uh, three couches all replicating in a master, master, master configuration. Um, and so uh, it, it really makes for a lot of flexibility. Let's say we've got a load balance cluster uh, we're absorbing reads and writes equally across the cluster, and they're all replicating with everything else. Maybe, maybe not the most efficient you know, topology, but it's one you can choose if you want it. Um, and then one of your couches dies for whatever reason. That, that machine gets its power cord severed. Um, but your, uh, your proxy in front, uh, at least most, most HTTP proxies, will detect that that server is gone and just take it out of the round robin load balancing, and your users will be none the wiser. So when that couch comes back up, it'll catch back up with replication and it'll be uh, and, and it'll just be running again. So this is this here is what uh, the BBC's deployment looks more like. So uh, imagine you've got uh, you know a couple of couches in one data center that are serving user requests and they're replicating to another data center also serving user requests. And then within both of those data centers, you know, these are the ones at the bottom edge and the top edge of this slide. You might have couches that, that replicate, um, you know, to do offline batch processing or other stuff where you want to take some data and, and, you know, run queries on it that you don't want to um, subject your user-facing couches to. Or whatever, it gives you that flexibility. So you can do a, um, you know, you can, you can use one couch as a data warehouse and another couch as uh, online transactions. So this is the use case that I'm really interested in. It's where there's a couch on every device you have and they're always replicating. So this is the Ubuntu One use case. Um, and uh, this really makes you think a lot about concurrency and, uh, and consistency. The nice thing about CouchDB's replication is that it is eventually consistent. It's not just like a big fog of data. Uh, at a certain point, if you stop introducing new changes to this cluster, eventually all couches will see the exact same data set, including conflicts. So if two people on uh, two remote nodes both both edit the same document in different ways and eventually they replicate to some third couch so that that couch has seen both those edits, what that couch will do is, is keep them both around. Um, and not only that, but any couch that sees both those edits will keep them both around and uh, deterministically pick one to be the winner. Um, and so the winner is just, it's just an arbitrary deterministic choice. Um, which will, you know, makes it easy to reason about what you're going to get back from view queries and whatnot. Uh, but the real way conflict detection works is that the uh, is that the user is expected to query and find documents that are in a conflict state and resolve those conflicts. So CouchDB doesn't try to magically resolve conflicts introduced by remote edits. It just keeps track of that data and lets the application handle it. And that's you know, there's certain things that people are way better at than computers and. ICB tries to respect that boundary.
Um, I see a question that, that uh, Nikolai's question in there um, that, that I, I will answer. Um, yes, uh, replication it can do uh, a bunch more stuff than just treating as one big homogeneous data set. So you can do filtered replication where you have uh, one master source database and then like let's say four derived databases that each you know only get certain kinds of documents. So if you're doing inventory tracking, maybe the actual inventory items, you could replicate just down to database A and you could replicate the delivery schedules down to database B um, and so on. Uh, and, and you can also do the reverse. So if you have a database with just inventory items and another one with delivery schedules and you need to merge them, that's very easy to do. Uh, I mean, CouchDB is none the wiser, so you just replicate them together and, and it's a merge. So, incremental MapReduce. Um, so, uh, last question that I'll answer there for, for Lazy Confabulator. Um, master slave and master master replication commands look exactly the same. Um, a master slave one would just be don't trigger the replication in the opposite direction. So each triggered replication is in one direction. If you want to do master master, you just trigger them in both directions at the same time. Um, so incremental MapReduce. Uh, you're probably familiar with MapReduce, especially from Google's use of it and Hadoop's um, use of it, and now they're starting to be used in a few other projects. As far as I know, CouchDB is the only project out there that has incremental MapReduce. So what that means is that your index, uh, you know, MapReduce works on, on the, um, you know, the idea that you have a function that visits all your data items. And so in most MapReduces, every time you change, uh, every time you change any of your data, you have to visit all your data items to um, run your query again. In CouchDB, you visit all your data items the first time, you scan that entire database, but afterward, it's only new changes that are touched by the function. So it's very efficient. Um, let's say you have 10,000 documents and you run, you, you write a new query and you store it in the da database. The first time you run that query, it's got to touch all 10,000 documents and that might take a couple minutes. But then you have, um, you know, or, or a few seconds, depending on your hardware. Um, and then you have a, uh, a new document come in or two new documents come in and you run the query again. CouchDB will automatically pick up those new changes and update the index to reflect them and then serve the query results. So that will be almost instantaneous. Uh, so you can use MapReduce and CouchDB for online query processing, which is, uh, you know, I, I think a big revolution in terms of what you can use MapReduce for. This function here on the bottom half of the screen is one from, uh, it's actually an old version of my blog software. Just to show you how flexible it is, this is just a map function. It's JavaScript that receives a document as its argument. Um, if the document is a post, it takes the HTML and, you know, strips it down, strips out the, the HTML tags and makes a shorter version of it. And then it emits uh, a key value pair where the key is doc.created at and the value is the information that you need as, uh, uh, you know, to render an atom feed or to render the front page of a blog. So the key is what's important here. The key is doc.created at. That means the documents in this index will be sorted by when they were created. It, it makes it, you know, really simple to, to do a blog because you've just got all the documents already in an index sorted properly. And you can just do a, a start key and end key to pull out the range of those documents that you want to have on the page. Um, it makes pagination really simple. You just render the next page starting from the document after the last one you saw. Um, and, uh, and, you know, this is just a, you know, bare minimum of the flexibility, but since you write your own functions, if you have documents that are in a variety of schemas in your database, like say that Mozilla testing use case, um, you can write a JavaScript function that pulls out the version of Firefox, you know, both from the test report, the crash reports that come in from end users and from the uh, testing harness that runs Firefox on the mobile phone, you know, that they've got in their test rig or the testing harness that runs it in EC2. And maybe those are all different uh, schemas because, you know, can't coordinate that whole development team about your schema up front. Um, but it doesn't matter because you just write a little JavaScript function that extracts the relevant information. And uh, it's extremely flexible once you wrap your head around it. Um, so here's another example of, of MapReduce. Uh, this is from a to-do to -do tracker app that I wrote. So uh, all this is doing is listing the most recent tasks that aren't done yet. Um, that should be 
pretty easy to read for anyone who's you know written any language with the control structures. Uh, so there's the emit function again. It's emitting the document sorted by it's created at time. Uh, I was I was looking around for like an impressive looking reduce function, and then I decided uh, to go with a realistic reduce function. And uh, realistically, in reduce, you're just going to be doing things like counting or summing. Um, you know, maybe taking a standard deviation. Uh, so you can you know count the number of uh, you know documents that have been tagged foo. That's that's very simple. The reduce would look just like the one you've got in front of you. Um, you know, in this case, what it'll allow you to do is uh, is query the uh, is query this list of tasks and see how many tasks uh, were created today that aren't done yet. Um, and since that, uh, since those indexes are dynamic or, or since, since they're structured uh, as a tree and the reduces are stored in a, in a particular way, it also allows you to dynamically query uh, how many tasks were created in the last week or the last month or the last year um, or, you know, in the month of January. And you can do all those queries uh, practically instantaneously with the same index uh, with just that simple reduce function. So I'll show you a little bit more about uh, the the internals or you know the, the principles on which this MapReduce works. So the view index B tree uh, is it's it's just a I mean if you're familiar with B trees it's pretty simple. I'll go through this. Uh, that bottom line there with the little tiny boxes that say V1, V2, V3, um, those are the values. Those are sorted by the keys. So if you look up inside the, you know, the that second layer of boxes, you see K3, K5, you know, K7, K11, K9. Um, and so you can see that it's just a, a linearly uh, single dimensional sort of the values by their keys. Um, and then what's what's really clever about how this is done is that the intermediate reduce values are stored on those interior nodes. So I don't want to um, you know get too dry here, but but the basic idea is let's say we're doing that count to reduce. Um, that box there, that that um, that R3 box is just going to say you know it's going to say seven, and uh, and over there on the other one it, it's going to say uh, it's going to say six, and then at the top you can sum those two. And get the you know the total 13 rows in the tree, and so that means that when you go through and update a portion of the tree, uh, only the uh, only the intermediate values that are affected have to be changed. So that means these uh, reduces can be updated in order log in time, which is part of how we're able to give practically instantaneous results if you're querying a live data set. Um, so you know I can take questions on this later, but I don't want to. I don't want to dwell. Um, there's a, here, here's one more just to help you understand how this all uh, interacts with the storage format. So this is my little hand drawn, but uh, so Grant, you might like this. Uh, the the top third there above the above the clock is a logical representation of the tree, just like we were looking at. Um, and then uh, yeah, no, you don't need to know this stuff to use Couch, but uh, it does help. You know when you're sort of like trying to figure out what's going to be an efficient query or, you know, what's the right use of couch. It, just, it doesn't hurt to know how it works. Um, so uh, the, uh, what you'll see is that as we're updating, you know, just this, uh, this block uh, JM that I've grayed out now to have uh, J prime M. So we just update the one block and then that one intermediate reduce uh, and then at the bottom that one, uh, you know, that next intermediate reduce up. So we only had to update, you know, the path to the root of the B tree for, for each update and it's written to the disk each time. Um, this means too that as your uh, views are being updated, anyone who's already querying a view, so like if you have a long running query because you have to pull out 10 million rows or something, um, that query is going to be consistent. It, it grabs a snapshot of the view when the query starts and it gets a consistent view of that query throughout its um, Throughout its response, which means that uh, you know, despite being a relaxing database uh, with you know a flexible query format, CouchDB is suitable for things like banking um, because you get these consistent results. So you can use a reduce function to find the current balance of all accounts, and you can be guaranteed that that will come back zero if you're using double entry bookkeeping. 
um, and then you can use range queries on that same reduced function and figure out the uh, balance of this account or that account. Um, so every document insert is ACID compliant and transactional and it allows you to have these really nice properties, um, uh, uh, consistency properties on the views. Um, so Martin's question is a good one. No, the index data is stored in the same file format as the database. Uh, so everything you, I just showed you here about this, you can extrapolate back to the database, but it's two files. So the database has a file and then the index has a file. All right, so HTTP. Um, HTTP is our friend. Uh, it's, you know, done well for us over the last 15 years. And, uh, and CouchDB uses it, you know, despite the, some people's reservations that it would have additional overhead. Uh, you know, on the web, that little bit of additional overhead doesn't really matter. Uh, obviously, the web has succeeded. So the big advantages to using HTTP is, one, you already know the API. So, you know, loading a document is just a get against the document URL. Saving the document is just a put against the document URL. Uh, you can do post to a database to create a new document if you don't care what ID it gives it. Um, and, uh, and all this stuff is, you know, properly RESTful. And by that I mean we have e-tags. So if you put a, a cache in front of CouchDB, then you can substantially reduce the load on the database. And, uh, you know, this, this works even with the user's browser cache. So if you're browsing a Couch app um, and you hit refresh after you've, you know, browsed the app, that second time is going to be really fast because, you know, most of the e-tags didn't change. Um, so, uh, so yeah, REST is really simple. If you've ever been burned by an HTTP API before, uh, just go look at CouchDBs. Like, we don't do any of that messy stuff that makes it painful. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very simple API. Um, and so you can use all kinds of existing tools. If you want to have more security controls or more granularity over your access controls than, than CouchDB has built in, then you can use, uh, you know, an Apache proxy or Nginx or anything in front of it to set up rewrite rules and uh, authentication, anything that, uh, that you want to do in front of your CouchDB. There's, you know, just so many, so many existing tools. There's, uh, you know, performance monitoring stuff. Pretty much everything your ops team knows how to use already works with CouchDB. So that was another big, um, you know, a big win when we're talking to some of these larger deployments is they don't have to learn a new binary protocol. They don't have to learn what its edge cases are or, you know, how to load balance it. Um, it's just, it's just HTTP. Uh, the last point is talking directly to the browser. Uh, don't underestimate the power of that. Like that's, we do all this, you know, this, this backend database stuff and we write these big web stacks and, you know, we hire these graphic designers and the whole point, the, the end goal of all that is to talk to the browser. Um, so if you can just, if you take out some layers and, and do a two layer app, then that's going to be, um, you know, it, it's, it's just takes a lot of complexity out and takes latency out. Uh, it's going to remove some maintenance costs because you're not maintaining that, that middle tier. Um, so if you can get away with it, you know, do a two layer app. Mebo started out using CouchDB in a three layer configuration and they've started doing some stuff uh, with two layer apps because it's, uh, you know, it's just simpler. So here's an example. This is actually from the Mebo project, uh, from Mebo's CouchDB Lounge project. They, you know, they wanted a, a multi-machine CouchDB cluster and, um, you know, as of uh, 0.11, which is a feature freeze for 1.0, CouchDB is single node software. It's not aware of a cluster because it doesn't have to be. The API was designed so that you get the same API whether or not you cluster it um, or run it on a single node. So they wanted a, um, a cluster where, you know, some small portion of the data would be served from each individual node. So CouchDB Lounge does that as, uh, as an HTTP tool. So it does consistent hashing, which means that if they are running it on 16 machines, each machine has 1 16th of the data. And, uh, and that, that's all written as an Nginx plugin. So Nginx is stable and fast and uh, you know, it's an evented architecture, so it has, you know, similar concurrency properties to CouchDB, so it, it doesn't present much of a bottleneck here. Um, so Nginx takes care of directing puts and gets to the appropriate cluster member, and then they have a um, twisted Python streaming view query engine, which does a, a scatter gather on the views. So 
when you send a query to the CouchDB lounge, it goes and sends that query out to all the all the cluster members. And you know, some cluster members may not have any rows to report, and some may have a lot of rows. And so uh, then the that um, CouchDB lounge takes care of merging all those view responses back. So you essentially get the uh, you know the same CouchDB API, but running on a cluster. Uh, it makes you know it makes a whole bunch of machines look like one couch. And that, this was fun because it kind of came out of some technical discussions we had. Uh, the goal is to do this in Erlang um, eventually. It's not a goal for 1.0 because for 1.0 we just want to nail down the API and the stability. Um, but the goal is to have CouchDB, you know, contain native features for this, and it will. Uh, but just, you know, we we had these discussions on the mailing list about what what strategy, what architecture to use. And then they just went and implemented it and open sourced it. So, you know, thank you, Mebo. Um, it's, you know, it's not written in Erlang, it's not built into CouchDB, but it's running in production at Mebo with, um, you know, millions, hundreds of millions of records, uh, a very high traffic site. So then they're not the only ones using it, but they're the, they're the ones who created it. Um, yeah, so, all right. Uh, um, Actually, yeah, I'll, I'll address that Cassandra question now because I think it's, it's worth addressing. So Alex asked a question here about Cassandra. Um, Cassandra is great. You know, they really went after the cluster management, uh, you know, that's climbing up that steep hill. So uh, CouchDB Lounge will do, you know, it'll run a cluster, um, but it doesn't have automatic facilities for, you know, throwing a new machine into the cluster and having it just, you know, grab that machine and, and throw it into the rotation. Um, so, uh, so Cassandra, they, you know, they, they, they saw a need for some software that could really be fire and forget, uh, elastic scalability and, uh, CouchDB will get there when we have the Erlang version of what CouchDB Lounge does. I, I have a feeling it'll be, you know, even easier to deploy, uh, in, you know, a thousand machines cl clusters than, than Cassandra is. Uh, but, you know, for now, our focus was on building something incredibly robust that could be a building block for larger clusters. So, you know, BBC's use of CouchDB, they have something a lot like CouchDB Lounge that's written in Java. They use that for their, uh, for their cluster management, and it does all the things that Cassandra does. Um, and we'll have that in Erlang eventually, and it'll be really fun. Um, Oh, Peter, that's a good question too. How does CouchDB different from MongoDB? Well, they both use JSON, and that's about where the similarity ends. Um, so, MongoDB uh, sacrifices, uh, you know, reliability and consistency for raw speed, which is great if you want to use it as like a session store or something for unimportant data. Um, but, you know, it's, it's not something that I would store, you know, my crucial data in. Um, and it's just not, uh, it, it's, it's, they're really going after a different uh, use case. They're optimized for, you know, like, uh, if you have a, an application that's going to be really chatty with the database. Um, I, I tend to think of MongoDB as being a lot like Redis, if you're familiar with Redis. It's just a, it's like an in-memory uh, cache thing that, you know, flushes the disk every once in a while and has some query options. Um, so uh, yeah, but uh, but we like we're, I, I love the fact that Mongo's out there because it's important to um, you know give people who want to use JSON as their data storage format uh, lots of options and you know if you need speed and you don't need um, absolute robustness then MongoDB might be the thing for you but when you need to be you know at a really high scale CouchDB is going to be a lot more reliable and a lot easier to reason about. Um, you know, even if it doesn't give you quite as many transactions per second on the same hardware, it will give you transactions that you can believe in. So the other thing that CouchDB's got um, that you know, no one else is really going after, uh, all these other NoSQL projects are like so excited about scaling up or, you know, providing some kind of flexible query options that, that don't quite fit the SQL paradigm. Um, but CouchDB is very interested in scaling down and uh, so, you know, we've got it here running on the OLPC, which is an ARM architecture. Uh, I've got CouchDB running on an Android phone here in the office. Um, that should be available in the Android store soon. 
Um, there is a couch out there that runs Couch TV to store your last FM profile so that it can massage you according to the music that you like. Um, that's a fun hack uh, that someone did. And uh, it's actually at FBZ on Twitter if you want to check out a cool hardware hacker who uh, put Couch TV in a couch. So, uh, so all right. Um, Scaling down, you know, is, is really important if you're building one of these databases that runs at the edge. Our goal is to be on phones, on you know, other other pieces of hardware, and uh, the idea being that that the network, the internet, you know, it'll get faster, it'll get more everywhere, but it, it, it it's availability. I just I don't see um, the network getting you know more reliable than it is now. There's always going to be that kid who saturates the whole thing with BitTorrent. Or you know that lightning storm that takes out the cable to your office, and if you're or, or you're in the subway, you know the down, downtime happens. Um, but if your database is on your local hardware or on a server running on your local network, then it's you know a lot. The the impacts to your availability are you know mitigated a lot. So you can um, you know still access your data, still do your work, and then later when your connection comes back online, it'll sync back up with the rest of the world. Um, yeah, um, it's it, uh, so the couch couch was by Fabian. Um, so at FBZ, or maybe there's like an underscore in there or something. Um, and uh, scaling down. So technically, let's talk about that. Mouse up here and click. Um, so Erlang uh, allows us to scale down because it has this really lightweight process model. Um, here's a concurrency benchmark that Joe Armstrong, the creator of Erlang, did. Uh, where he had, uh, you know, he compared it to Apache HTTPD. Um, across the bottom is the number of concurrent requests, and the vertical axis is the throughput. So you can see that uh, Apache HTTPD, you know, kind of falls over when you get to, you know, maybe like 4,000 concurrent users. And uh, and this Erlang web server that he was benchmarking just kept going. You know, like at a certain point they had to give up benchmarking it because it's hard to generate that kind of load. So it went up to about 80,000 concurrent connections um, and maintaining the same overall throughput. Uh, so if you're interested in that, I would suggest you know checking out the URL down there in the corner. Um, but it's you know it's it's a pretty good example of how to do a um, a concurrent benchmark. So uh, Peter, I'll I'll get to your binary question afterward. Um, so browser couch. This is a project to um, they get CouchDB running against the HTML5 storage APIs and then replicate back up to the, uh, you know, a real CouchDB on a server somewhere. It's coming along pretty well. Uh, there's been some work on it lately. And, uh, it, you know, once you have CouchDB running in JavaScript against HTML5, then, you know, it's, it's on the iPhone. It's on, you know, all these places that are harder, at least politically, to get the Erlang VM and the CouchDB running. Um, so this is a fun project, and I've been watching it. And, you know, kind of people start hacking on it, and I offer to help them understand how CouchDB works. Um, I, I mentioned this earlier. We got uh, you know Android running on the CouchDB or CouchDB running on the Android phone. Uh, this is Damian Katz here uh, holding up our Android phone when we started the contest. We we just you know whoever got CouchDB running on this phone first gets the phone, and the install path we're going to use is the Android store. So we've got it running via clicking the custom URL. Now all we need to do is, is get that to happen via the Android store. Um, and then uh, the guy who's doing this is, is going to get a phone. So maybe you can beat him to it. Uh, and then this phone will be yours. But uh, it's pretty fun to just have the couch running there locally. It's, it's a good, um, you know, it feels good. Um, so so CouchDB is a local web platform. and. Uh, yeah, go David. Uh, I got. I'll get you an iPhone if you can pull it off. Um, so, although I think that one's going to be harder, um, what with the new iPhone dealies. So, CouchDB, the local web platform, um, and that you know opens up all these opportunities. Uh, this is sort of you know now we've talked about the technicalities. Um, let's talk about sort of why this matters. Um, so the internet is going like this, and it's just going to keep going like this. But you know, as I mentioned, downtime still happens. Um, there's there's another trend, another big picture trend. Everyone talks about how bandwidth is going through the roof, 
but uh, there should be another curve on here, which is the amount of attached storage. The network is getting faster, but it's not getting faster um, you know, as rapidly as the amount of data people deal with is growing. So uh, that just means you have to have some sort of offline capability, some way to pull more data closer to you before you need it. Otherwise, things are just going to be too slow. Um, and so, you know, it, the, the network's going to get, I, I think the network's going to get busier faster than it gets faster. So this kind of means you need an offline mode in order to scale. So uh, some deployment models that you can uh, you can use CouchDB for. Uh, so here's some more of those hand-drawn slides. Uh, there's a normal server, right? It's just a couch in the cloud. Maybe it's sitting behind the Ruby on Rails app or your Java stack or whatever. Um, and so we're all familiar with this. CouchDB has all these nice benefits, the append-only storage model, the robustness, uh, the concurrency, to you know really be uh, useful and, and, and safe in a standard deployment. Um, but there's a problem that, you know, got nothing to do with CouchDB or your, your middle tier stack or any of that. The problem is that when you've got a web application, a, a website that gets popular, you have the thundering herd and everyone is, you know, running and going to that website as fast as they can and hitting refresh all the time. Um, and you have to tune for latency because if it takes half a second for that page to load, then the person is either going to give up and go away or hit refresh and compound the problem. So there's just something inherent in the nature of the web that, um, you know, you get these hot spots, um, the slash dot effect or whatever we're calling it these days. Um, so with CouchDB, you can do an offline app where uh, if your users have CouchDB installed on their local machine, they can replicate your app down uh, and, and browse it locally while uh, the whole time they're continuously replicating with the server. And the nice thing about uh, having the server, the client server connection be, be a replication instead of being, uh, you know, on a per request basis is that you don't have to tune for latency. You can tune for throughput. And if something takes an extra half second for some data to schlep around, users aren't going to notice because their local requests are, um, you know, are very, uh, are very fast because they don't have to go over the network. Um, and the, uh, so, so the answer on the binary data is, is absolutely yes, and I'll, I'll say some more details about that in a bit. Um, so then, you know, this is the thing I'm excited about, where everyone's got a CouchDB and the applications are running locally. Some of these applications may not even have a, um, you know, a cloud home, like a, a, a centralized owner. Um, but that doesn't mean that they are isolated. So you can, it's like, it's like the desktop, but with the connectedness of the web. And, there's, you know, I've been writing some applications like this. All the couch apps are inherently uh, like this, even if even if you don't uh, try for it. You just write an app that runs on your local machine, and like next thing you know, you can replicate it with your buddies, and everyone can use it in real time. Um, and I think that this is really the future of where the web is going. Um, and uh, and and I, and I think part of that is is you know some of those those physics. Things I just mentioned that you know the network isn't growing as fast as the stuff people want to do with it, um, but it's also uh, it's also a programming model that it's exciting to me because uh, you have these you know these documents that CouchDB treats as applications, uh, so you could do view source on the application. And I don't know about you all, but this is how I learned to program was I went to some website and hit view source and looked at it and thought, hey, that's not that hard. Um, and uh, I, I really, I think having the, the code out there with the apps and having the apps be so simple, you know, like I did a chat client and kind of 150 lines of JavaScript um, really opens up what has, you know, used to be open and then turned into some web programmer wizardry. And, and I think it's going to open it back up again for kids to surprise us by, you know, building the apps that, that they want to see. Um, so, yeah, I, I hope that's exciting to you too. Uh, now, you know, in that peer-to-peer -peer web, the, the data flows, I think, are a lot more humane. Um, and, and what I mean by that is that replication, once you understand it, is a primitive that you know, it's, it's sort of like clicking a hyperlink. 
Uh, everyone understands clicking a hyperlink. Um, you know, non-technical folks understand when you click that link, it's going to take you to, uh, you know, some other piece of content. Um, and so replication is just as simple. It says, you know, when I trigger this replication, I push my data over to there. And so if I want to share photos with grandma, you know, I replicate to her. I don't have to, like, I don't have to stick my photos in the Facebook cloud and then, you know, hope for the best with my privacy settings. Um, I, I just replicate them where I want them to go. And uh, I think that, you know, we're, we're still in early days for this, but once this gets to be easy enough that normal people can play around with it, it's going to be, uh, you know, relaxing for the web, much less of this, you know, sort of the users feeling like they're, they're trapped by the, the engineer's powers and the, um, you know, working how the engineers want them to. Um, so, uh, so that's about it for, um, you know, my prepared remarks, but I want to take some questions. Um, and the first one that I saw was, um, we're talking about how uh, binary attachments work. So each document can have uh, as many binary attachments in it as you want. Um, and the binary attachments can be put directly to CouchDB. All the, all the work on the CouchDB side is, is streaming, so there's no buffering. Uh, that means that you can attach like a, you know, an entire DVD ISO image to a CouchDB document, no problem. Um, and so then when you do the git again, it streams back out. CouchDB can write those binary attachments, um, you know, concurrently. So you can have 100 people all uploading uh, giant files to a CouchDB instance and it'll just handle it, no problem. Um, it'll just be streamed. To disk and they're interleaved on disk in the in the main database file. Um, so, uh, so Dick Davies' question about attachment versioning. Um, well, so since we don't uh, since since we don't touch the file except for compaction once it's been written, yeah, all the old versions of the binary attachments are on disk. But that's not to say that CouchDB is a version control system. It's, it's important to, uh, to understand that the, the semantics of the document model are that only the latest version of the document actually exists. If your application depends on old versions of the document staying around, you're going to get in trouble because when you're on a, a cluster, uh, replication only replicates the latest version of the document. The old versions of the document disappear after compaction and, uh, you know, soon we'll be adding an auto compact feature so CouchDB will compact occasionally for itself. Um, the, uh, so yeah, you can get back to old versions of, of attachments, but don't, um, you know, don't, don't count on it. Uh, so good, more questions. Um, yeah, so sites like Dig using CouchDB, sure, yeah, I love it when people use CouchDB. Um, it's, it's great for, uh, I mean, it's really great for any kind of any kind of site that follows the classic web model of you know having users update some data. Um, it, you know, it'd be uh, there, there's other things that might be better for uh, you know real time audio streaming. I wouldn't necessarily stream real time audio through CouchDB, but uh, for for anything with a standard you know uh, load some resources and ship them over to the browser and accept updates to those resources. Uh, CouchDB is uh, CouchDB's programming model is about as good as it gets, and the implementation is robust and reliable. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah. So there's um, some questions here about the security model. Um, the 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 main uh, the the security model has been around for a long time. Uh, but only in the most recent release, CouchDB 0.11, uh, which is a feature freeze for 1.0, did it get integrated and simplified and sort of like brought out in the UI. Um, so CouchDB has a write authorizations are, 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 are protected with a validation function. So this is just a JavaScript function that sees the update when it comes in. It has access to the old version of the document, if there was one, the new version that the user is trying to save and then some information about the user who's doing the operation. And the function can inspect all those, you know, it's just JSON, so it's real easy to calculate stuff on in JavaScript. And then it can either throw an error or not. And 
So you can throw unauthorized or you can throw forbidden. Um, and if you throw unauthorized, then it prompts the user to log in. And if you throw forbidden, then it says, I don't care. You know, you're logged in as somebody who can't do this. Um, so it's, uh, it, it's very robust because you can do anything you, you want. And it runs inside the database. So you don't have to worry about, you know, somebody missing an edge case in the application source code. And like all of a sudden, there's an unvalidated input getting in. Um, the, uh, the other nice thing about this is that those validation functions run uh, replication as a client just like any other. So if you have, if you replicate an entire database out to an untrusted user and then they mess with some data and replicate it back up, your validation function can uh, prevent them from doing things that they shouldn't do. And it's very simple uh, because all your validation logic is in one place. But that's just for update validation. Read validation is a different story. For, for read control, uh, it's on a per database level. So we encourage you to do things like have a database per work group or a database per user. Um, so it, it's very helpful to think of a database as a shared workspace. So you know maybe you would have a, a database for your cooking class and everyone could edit recipes in there and anyone who wasn't in the cooking class wouldn't even be allowed to read that database. Um, but then say uh, the, the cooking class teacher might want to take that entire database and replicate it to the, um, you know, to the cooking school's database um, you know, for just their archives or whatever. They can just do that and then maybe the access controls on the cooking school's global database are completely different. Um, and so, you know, this model uh, is, it's designed for simplicity because trying to do access control on a per document basis, it's really complicated, especially once you start to bring views into the picture. Um, because, you know, then you have to mark each row in the view as which users are allowed to see it or not. Um, and then for reduced views, it's even worse because, you know, the, um, the overall sums, uh, you know, the bank account balances of, of my accounts, um, you know, there's, just, there's no way to, to do that practically um, without incurring a whole bunch of complexity and, um, you know, computation overhead. Um, so, um, uh, cases where I would use a SQL database instead of Couch. Um, you're asking the wrong guy. Um, I, I never really used SQL for all the magic stuff that it can do. You know, I was kind of the DHH school. It's a big hash in the sky. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I've used MySQL. I've used Postgres. I've run transactions. It's sure is nice that Postgres has nested transactions, but I think it's actually, um, I think that stuff is actually sort of a, uh, it handicaps you because you start to use it and then this stuff doesn't really work at scale. I mean, it works at medium large scale, but it doesn't work at web scale. Um, and so, you know, I, I had to stop using Postgres for my web spidering project because it's just, you know, you can't have a table of all the unique URLs. That doesn't, you don't get to do that. Um, so, uh, let's see. Um, what do we have here? Oh yeah, Chris Hunt has a great question. I piped a 50 megabyte CSV file into Couch and ended up with a two gigabyte database. What's with that? Um, yeah, Chris, it's, um, we do tend to take up more disk space than the source. That seems, that seems outsized uh, and it should get a lot smaller if you compact that database. Um, also, if you, uh, if you were to do something, uh, like if you use bulk inserts, then you should have less B-tree overhead. So if you insert those documents one at a time, then you start writing a bunch of data to the B-tree that is you know, immediately invalidated by the next update. So the best thing to do after you do an import like that is to compact the database. Um, and if you want your imports to stay small, then you want to, uh, you want to use bulk inserts to do it. Um, so for the record, I think that, you know, aside from the operational complexity of running Couch on a 100 node, 200 node cluster, I think Couch would be great for Twitter. Um, I, I'm not going to go try and sell it to them right now. I, I think that once we've got the Erlang clustering stuff built in, which, you know, should be there for sure by Couch 2.0 and, and hopefully sooner than that, um, sites like Twitter or, um, you know, similar sites will be using CouchDB um, all the time. 
And there are already some Twitter search companies, so companies that have access to the fire hose um, that are piping that whole fire hose into CouchDB and using CouchDB um, as the basis of their search engine. Um, so that's part of what Cloud does is, is host Couch for some of those companies. Um, let's see. So I'm looking more. There's there's a bunch of questions here about the access control. Um, so there there is uh, I'll say it again there is no per document access control and that's by design. Um, and and that's because the information leakage, leakage from view queries is too great. Um, filtered replication is the solution to that. So if you have a centralized database with um, you know all the info in it, and then you want to only give some subset of that to user X, then create a database for user X and run a replication filter um, so that only the updates that user X is allowed to see go to that that secondary database, and then give user X full access to, to the X database. Um, so it's a different way of thinking about it. A lot of people are wrapped up in this um, relational model of um, you know, attaching a whole bunch of policy to each individual row or table. Um, and I think that that is, you know, and it, and it seems right to us because we're so used to that, that model, but um, once you wrap your mind around, you know, if a person has access to a database, they have access to the whole database, so just only stick stuff in there they're allowed to mess with. Um, it, it's a lot simpler and easier to reason about. Um, so I'll, I'll say a little bit about filtered replication. It works much like the validation functions. It's just a JavaScript function that gets each update before the replicator uh, sends it out and says, you know, yes or no. It just returns true or false. If it returns true, then that update is replicated. If it returns false, then it isn't. Um, Yes, geospatial. We are um, we're working with uh, with a guy Volker, um, you know, at uh, at VMX. He's uh, doing a, a student project to write an Erlang geospatial indexer along the CouchDB model, so that we can just plug it in. Um, but CouchIO is working on a CouchDB distribution that will include um, maybe a commercial geo indexer for now, as well as the CouchDB Lucene stuff and everything. Um, so, yeah, we, we see geo-indexing as being very important. Um, so there's a question, what's the recommended cache in front of CouchDB? Um, most people either use Apache or Nginx. Um, and there's stuff on the wiki about how to configure both of those. Um, Teddy. Teddy asks, can you use OAuth with CouchDB? Yes, CouchDB ships with OAuth support. I'm not an expert on that stuff. Um, Ubuntu uses CouchDB's OAuth support both to, for applications to log into your local CouchDB as well as for your CouchDB to log into their remote cloud. So um, you can, there's documentation on the wiki and uh, maybe if you're familiar with OAuth, the best thing to do is look at the source. But I always say look at the source and I, I think I ignore the documentation that's out there because the source reader kind of guy. Um, so uh, Horst asks about replication to and from a protected couch. Um, so CouchDB by default just uses HTTP basic auth for replication. Um, but you can use, you can set, set up proxies to do any kind of authentication you want. And it's really easy to write, you know, like a 10 to 50 line Erlang function that will be a pluggable auth module. So there's already the ability to authenticate using um, having the, a proxy set X headers. Um, but uh, you can write your own authentication. There's people who are integrating with LDAP, um, GSS API, stuff like that. So since our authentication mo uh, you know, model is really simple, it's, it's also easy to plug in. Um, yes, uh, JP's question. Uh, so CouchDB 0.11, which my next webcast will um, really dive into, st has a user's database that stores the user's um, you know, name and passwords in a database. Um, in 0.11, we're just using uh, salted hash. And so that's not as secure as I'd like it to be. We're going to move to bcrypt. 
um, so that if somebody gets access to that user's database, your that your passwords are still pretty safe. Um, so, so Horst, uh, Futon actually uses cookie auth, which CouchDB 011 ships with. Um, so when you log in, CouchDB sets a cookie, and it's got you know all those um, nice timeout things and and um, the you know cross site protection. Um, but yeah, uh, Futon uses the cookie auth. So the next webcast will be May 21st at 10 a.m. Um, so about a month from now, and uh, the the topic is going to be Couch Apps and you know writing. Essentially, if you, if you know jQuery um, and you have CouchDB installed locally, then you'll be able to play along and run some of this code, and and we can probably even you know share a um, a workspace on a hosted CouchDB server so that everyone can. You know, we might we might run chat um, through that CouchDB. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, we'll see see how good the the um, you know my code is by then. But I'm working on some code that should be really exciting to show off and, and help with. Um, so yeah, this question keeps coming up. How long until 1.0? It's an open source project, so I can't I can't speak for the project. Um, but we're not going to do anything you know fancy or surprising between now and 1.0. Um, there are some bugs and some uh, you know, security enhancements and uh, and mostly just like little rough edges in the API. You know, places where where we could be less surprising um, that we want to clean up between now and 1.0. And uh, 1.0, I mean, I'll be surprised if it's you know on the, on the very outside, like three months from now. Um, hoping that it's you know within a month or two, but uh, it, it should be soon. Yeah, thanks to everybody for coming out. This was fun. Uh, I'll see you next month. And if you, you know, if you still have questions, feel free to contact me on Twitter, or uh, you know, hit the CouchDB mailing lists. Everything is at uh, Apache or CouchDB.Apache.org. Um, and if you go to http colon slash slash couch.io, you can see, uh, you know, this is my company's website. We've got uh, a lot of you know, commercial services around CouchDB, but we also have some fun stuff. Like a, if you go through the, the backlinks on the blog, you can see the music video for the CouchDB theme song. Um, and there's some documentation about what's new in 011. So it should be a, um, you know, a worthwhile visit for you. Um, I'll just close this out by singing the CouchDB theme song, even though it's not um, accompanied by our uh, you know, wonderful music video. Uh, all right. Bum bum ba 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 bum ba 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 bum Couch D B Couch D B Couch D B Relax. Okay, great. So it's a thanks. lot of fun. Thanks, Chris. That was that was awesome today. Thank you so much. And I want to thank everyone who joined us today too. Um, I don't have a copy of the chat room transcript right now, but I probably will later today. If you need a copy of it, just send me an email that you can send it to webcast at O'Reilly.com. And um, we're going to be releasing a CD of Chris's music. And you can also email me at web. I'm kidding about that. We don't have it. But um, I hope you all join us for the next um, webcast by Chris. And if you have a second, please take our post um, post webcast survey that will open up in the a survey monkey window when you leave here. We really appreciate the feedback, so hope you'll give it to us. And that's about it. I'm the video. We'll I'll send everyone a link as soon as we have the video ready. It will be on YouTube, and I think you'll find it on uh, Chris's site, embedded there, and on our webcast site. And we'll also send a link where you can just play back the archive version here, which has uh, clickable links and searchable chat and everything. So that's it. I'm going to close out the uh, meeting now. Thank you, everyone.